We are in a very precarious situation, both in the United States and worldwide, because the recession of 2008 produced politically the same outcomes as the Great Depression of 1929-1932 produced. A lot of uh, xenophobia, populism, nationalism eventually resulted in, in the big war. We have uh, the, the, the rise of the, of the populist and nationalist leaders globally, worldwide. So it's a global battle. If, if one of their guys wins, they all win. Uh, so it's, 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 it's a battle for democracy and uh, uh, it's, it's not just a cliche. I'm not just saying something to, 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 to sound somehow global or alarmist or mobilize support for Ukraine where, where maybe there is no reason for that. Uh, it, it, is, it, it is a case of um, clash between uh, autocracy and, and democracy. Hi, everyone. This is AJ Woodhams, host of the War Books podcast, where I interview today's best authors writing about war-related topics. Uh, today, I am extremely excited to have on the show Serhi Plohi for his new book, The Russo-Ukrainian War, The Return of History. Uh, Serhi is a professor of Ukrainian history and director of the Ukrainian Research Institute at Harvard University. He is a leading authority on the history of the Cold War, and he is the author of Atoms and Ashes, A Global History of Nuclear Disasters, and Nuclear Folly, A History of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Serhi, how are you today? Well, I'm good. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be on your, on your show, to be on your program. So I look forward to really great questions and, and interesting conversation. Yeah, well, the pleasure is all mine um, because I am so glad that you wrote this book. You know, I, I, and I'm, I'm glad because I remember, I think a lot of other people felt this way too. And you actually write about it a little bit as well. Although, of course, you've got much more context. In February of, of 2022, I remember hearing on the news that Russia was massing troops on the Ukrainian border and they were probably going to invade Ukraine. And I was like, how could that be possible? You know, it, it seemed like such a surprise, but but Putin didn't just wake up one day and was like, I think today I'll invade Ukraine. There's a lot of history behind how this invasion happened and how, how this war started. And I thought your, your book did an excellent job of filling in that gap for me, because um, it really, when you look at the history, maybe it wasn't such a surprise that uh, that this war started. So maybe first, in your own words, um, a question I, I like to ask everyone on the show, could you just tell the audience, <clears throat> what is your book about? Well, the book is uh, very straightforward. It's about the subject that is in the main title of the book, The Russo-Ukrainian War. And uh, what is a little bit more complex is exactly the issue of uh, where to start that story. And uh, uh, one thing that I'm really stating in the book and, and try to show as clearly as I can is that the war didn't start on February 24th, 2022. Last year, the war started uh, in February of 2014 with the annexation of the Crimea by the Russian special forces and, and military and, and Russian Navy. And if you look deeper into the history, the, the triggers for the war, preconditions, the context is really the context of the disintegration of first the Soviet Union back in 1991. And even earlier than that, uh, the disintegration of the European empires, including the Russian Empire, in the middle of World War I. The Bolsheviks stitched together the Russian Empire using force, but also using new ideology called communism. And it lasted for a while. Then in 1991, it fell apart. We were all relieved that the fall of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War, took place without a major conflict. 
And what we realize now that that major conflict, that major war was not avoided. It was just postponed. And it, it is happening right now between the two largest successor states to the Soviet Union and the Russian Empire, which is Russia and Ukraine. And uh, that's, that's one of the meanings of the subtitle of the book. The subtitle is The Return of History. So I, I bring a lot of history to explain, to explain the, the, the developments, but uh, there is also, there is also uh, another meaning of the return of history. Back in 1989, Francis Fukuyama published an article and then later a book on the victory of um, uh, democracy, liberal democracy. As, uh, as form of government and uh, in that context uh, end of history. And um, it looks like our hopes were a little bit premature. We all were, I, I certainly shared your, your thoughts and your feelings when I listened to the news about Russia massing troops on the waters with Ukraine, that how could it be? The, the, that sort of things were happening back in the 20th century, unprovoked aggressions, um, the, the annexation of the territories, uh, the, the imperial wars. Uh, but uh, now history, history, unfortunately, is back, including those very, very bad and, and um, uh, dramatic parts of history of the 20th century. Yeah, and you're so right when it comes to to, to war in history and trying to figure out, you know, where, where things started. Um, because you can just, you can keep going back. Something that I was surprised to learn that, that you wrote about with Crimea is that was just a couple days uh, after the Maidan protests that ousted the Ukrainian leader. So you'd be like, oh, well, maybe that was the start of, of things. But if you go back further, then, you know, there's just this whole, there's this whole line, this succession of events that happened that, that brought us here. I actually want to want to start before we kind of dive into the history. I want to start with your afterward, because you write that this book was a very personal book for you, and the Russo-Ukrainian War has really impacted you personally and impacted your family. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I come from Ukraine, and uh, I was in touch with my with my family, part of my family that that is in Ukraine in the days and weeks leading to the war. Uh, the war the war affected uh, my family in, in many ways. So my sister was a refugee for a while, then, then came back, returned. Um, one of my cousins uh, died, was killed in, in battle near Bakhmut. And uh, what, I, what I see now in terms of statistics, uh, up to 80% of Ukrainians today either have uh, a relative or a friend that was killed or was wounded by the war. So from that point of view, it looks like just my my um, case is, is is very typical for for Ukrainian general. Wow, that I, that is I didn't I didn't realize that because um, that's a massive amount of. You know, everybody's got somebody. Then, almost everybody's got somebody yes. who yes. Uh, right. who has died in this war. Well, uh, let's let's dive into the the history so so that we can we can get to some kind of understanding of of where we're at today. Let's let's maybe start with the Soviet Union's collapse because it seemed like a lot of the causes for this war stemmed. From that, although you said that you know it still even goes back further further than that, but specifically, I'm interested in the the relationship between Ukraine and Russia at the collapse of the Soviet Union and how that evolved. Well, the uh, Soviet Union was dissolved by leaders of three countries. Uh, it was Boris Yeltsin of Russia. Leonid Kravchuk of Ukraine and um, Stanislav Shushkevich of Belarus. Um, that happened on uh, December 8, 1991. Uh, important uh, important um, things to keep in mind is that only one week before uh, 
those three leaders gathered in Belarus and signed agreements, so-called uh, the Belaveja agreements on the dissolution of the Soviet Union. One week before that, a referendum took place in Ukraine, where more than 90% of Ukrainians who participated in the referendum, and the turnout was over 80%. So more than 90% of those 80% voted for independence of their country. And uh, uh, that, that was really triggered for the dissolution of the Soviet Union. The question is why, why the Soviet Union was dissolved after the Ukrainian referendum when the question on the referendum was not about the future of the Soviet Union. The question was whether people of Ukraine supported the resolution of their parliament for independence of Ukraine. So the idea was, okay, whether Ukraine should be independent or not. If it should be independent, it leaves the Soviet Union, but whatever happens to the Soviet Union, it's not, it's not the subject that was discussed or, or, or voted on in Ukraine. But still the Soviet Union was dissolved because uh, the important role of Ukraine in the Soviet Union. It was the second largest Soviet Republic after Russia. And uh, uh, it's also very interesting that Russia, Boris Yeltsin's Russia, was one of the first countries that recognized independence of Ukraine. So that happened before, before the United States did that and, and a number of other countries. And uh, uh, but uh, the the idea, the Russian idea was, uh, and Yeltsin's idea at that time, was that the recognition of that of the independence was not unconditional. Uh, the, Russia really recognized Ukrainian independence and independence of other republics, on the condition that in one way or another they would stay as part of the Russian sphere of influence. So at the same meeting where the Soviet Union was dissolved, the Commonwealth of Independent States was created. Yeltsin was elected as the head of, of that, of that uh, association. So um, the issue of borders between Russia and Ukraine, uh, Yeltsin took the position that the borders can stay as they were if there is some form of association between Russia and Ukraine. There is no form of association, so in other words, if there is no Russian dominance over Ukraine, uh, if um, Russian, if Ukrainian independence is really for real, then Russia reserved, reserved the right to revise um, borders and, 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 and do other things. So at the end of the day, Russia and Ukraine, the two largest republics, turned out to be the ones whose position was crucial for the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Um, yeah. That's, 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 uh, the, the meeting was taking place in Belarus. The Belarus leaders were present there, but they were really junior partners in all of that. They were hosting the, the meeting of big guys, of two big guys, meaning the presidents of Russia and president of Ukraine. And... Uh, uh, from that point of view, when you look today at this war, the importance of the events of 1991 is that on the, to the same degree that Ukraine was crucial for the continuation or non-continuation of the Soviet experiment, Ukraine became crucial for any attempts on part of Russia to rebuild Russian control over the post-Soviet space. The difference between uh, Yeltsin on the one hand and Putin on the other is that Putin basically continued with the same program that Yeltsin had, but unlike Yeltsin, he was using not just economic or political instruments to keep Russian or, or, or establish or reestablish Russian control over the post-Soviet space, but he used the military force. He first did that in Georgia in 2008 then in Ukraine in 2014, and then again in Ukraine in 2022. So Putin's contribution to that, uh, and that's only, if you look at that historically, you can understand that, is not really in, in rethinking or reconceptualizing things. 
but actually using different tools to achieve the same the same goals that Russia had already since ninety one or ninety two. Yeah, well, let's 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 talk about uh, Putin at, at this time. Yeah, I'm very curious. How did how did Putin view Ukraine in the '90s, and and how did that how did his his concept of history and Ukrainian history what is his what is his view on that, and and how did that change? Yes, uh, the, the the war, the current uh, stage of the war. Uh, started with uh, Putin publishing a um, historical essay, or maybe sort of historical essay, on uh, which was titled "On the um, Historical Unity of Russians and Ukrainians," and it was a long historical uh, historical expose that was supporting the the argument, the statement that was in the very first paragraph of the essay. And it was, the, the statement was that Russians and Ukrainians were one and the same people. And uh, uh, what that really meant was that Ukrainians are really Russians. So they don't exist as a separate nation, or at least not supposed to exist. And that is a major departure from uh, the Soviet policies. Uh, in the Soviet Union, Russia and Ukraine were at least pro forma recognized as equal republics. And of course, there was a recognition that Ukraine is a separate nation. Where uh, Putin's uh, really rejection of that model is coming from, it is coming from the Russian imperial uh, writers and thinkers of the late 19th and the beginning of the 20th century was Russian imperial vision that there were no separate Ukrainian nation. There were uh, maybe separate, separate quote unquote tribe, or separate uh, uh, group within a big Russian nation. And uh, that, that idea really comes back to Russia in the 1990s exactly at the time when Putin and uh, people of his generation, uh, they got certainly disappointed with the ideas of communism, with the Bolshevik experiment, and were looking for alternative ways of understanding reality around them. And they found them in the writings of the Russian imperial thinkers or the emigres. So some of um, authors that, that Putin reads like philosopher Ilyin, like the uh, memoirs of the Russian general of the revolutionary era and civil war, Anton Dunikin, they all transmit these ideas really that came into existence in, in the late uh, Russian empire. For um, generations of the, of the young Soviet uh, apparatchiks and KGB officers and party uh, officials, uh, these ideas were presented and repackaged by the um, uh, laureate of, of the Nobel Prize in Literature, um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. So Solzhenitsyn is a classic Russian nationalist who repackaged the, the Russian imperial ideas in the new context. He was very anti-communist. He wrote Archipelag Gulag. He himself was a prisoner of Gulag, so there was no love lost for any sort of the communist experimentation. But the alternative was Russian imperial, Russian imperial paradigm, a little bit adjusted to the to the new realities, and that what became the 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 the, the, the foundation for Putin's thinking and thinking of uh, some people around him as well. That's where these ideas are coming from. Solzhenitsyn uh, is, is, is one of the favorite uh, Putin's, uh, Putin's writers. He certainly um, uh, visited him before he died. He took special, special care of um, uh, all sorts of memorialization uh, of, of uh, Solzhenitsyn. Um, so um, in, in that sense, again, uh, Putin um, is certainly um, very much responsible for this war, including through his actions and through his 
through his statements and writings, but it's not just a Putin phenomenon. It's, it's, it's a broader, it's a broader phenomenon. Well, would you say with that kind of, um, worldview that, that Putin had, uh, Putin and people like him, would it, would it be fair to say that then ever since he came into power in the late nineties, he has wanted to absorb Ukraine into Russia and is there is there is there any evidence that he had already begun planning as soon as he came into power? What what one can see is that he very much stayed loyal to the to these ideas that I discussed earlier that came into existence in the nineteen nineties around Yeltsin that um, uh, Russia Russia has in one or more another control and dominate the post-Soviet space. So they were um, before before Yeltsin. Uh, uh, so sorry, before Putin came to power, uh, there was a Russian Prime Minister um, uh, Evgeny Primakov, who was one of advisors to Gorbachev, then to Yeltsin and then the head of the Russian intelligence service before becoming prime minister. And uh, he very much came with the idea that um, the, the uh, bipolar world of the Cold War um, fell apart after the end of the Cold War. There is um, an American world, a, a unipolar world. Again, that's not Primakov's idea. Many people were writing about that. But Primakov was pushing for the for the for the um, idea that the the unipolar world uh, is 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 uh, will not last for a long period of time. It's it's certainly wrong way to organize international relations. It is not in Russian interests, and what would be in Russian interests is a multipolar world, where there is different different poles. So. Russia understood that it was not the Soviet Union, so there was no return to bipolar world. So the idea that there would be a multipolar world with China and European Union and, and Russia as one of the, of the poles. But there also came very early realization that without somehow mobilizing resources of the post-Soviet space, it would be very difficult for Russia to become one of the poles in multipolar world. Uh, which uh, again was was the, the, the sort of a thinking that was there before Putin, and uh, uh, Putin early on in his during his first his first uh, term as the president uh, was uh, basically continuing in the in the Yeltsin's in, in, in the Yel Yeltsin's. Uh, in, uh, way of thinking and uh, looking for the ways of how to do that by using um, political force and economic force. His big hope was that uh, for for joining uh, Washington's at that time, Judge uh, W. Bush's war on terror, that he would get uh, recognition from Washington and uh, NATO for uh, having Soviet Union as his sphere of influence. And that didn't work out. Uh, then when he was almost there to bring Ukraine into the Russian sphere of influence, the Orange Revolution in 2004 started in Ukraine. A democratic revolution rejecting the sort of elections that Putin wanted to introduce in Ukraine, which would be manipulated, rejecting the, the candidate that Putin supported. It was uh, Mr. Yanukovych at that time, and electing pro-Western pro -Western democratic leader, Mr. Yushchenko. So uh, for Putin, that was really a turning point that uh, uh, West, West rejected his, what he considered to be just claims for the Russian special uh, 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 special rights in the in the post-Soviet space that um, NATO continued uh, expansion and putting uh, uh, the Baltic states joined NATO that the uh, his attempts to um, to build this this Russian bloc uh, 
were undermined by democratic movements and, and public uh, public mobilization. He believed that the United States was behind that, both in terms of encouraging Ukrainians to rebel, but more than that, introducing this awful, uh, um, awful political model of democracy, right, which which uh, undermined not only his efforts outside of Russia, but also undermined his attempts to create more authoritarian regime in Russia itself. So um, he considered promotion of democracy to be to be an unfriendly, unfriendly move, really an attempt to uh, personally undermine him. So the American American ambassador in the in Moscow, uh, Mike McFall, is being is being pushed out. There is a personal grudge on the part of Putin to Hillary Clinton because he believes that she was the one who encouraged protests in uh, uh, and supported protests in Russia in uh, 2011, 2012. So um, that's that's where the the really um, not goal goal didn't change, but that's where change came in terms of the selection of the tools and and rhetoric and and level of hostility that was there not only vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, but also vis-a-vis -vis the West. So, and the current war, it's war in Ukraine, but if you if you look at uh, Putin's rhetoric, it was um, explained by him, legitimized by him on two levels. One level was fighting against the West, another level was, was the argument that Ukrainians don't exist as a nation. So that one was imperial argument, this war on the West was really a continuation of the multipolar world uh, um, thinking that that started before before Putin, that it started in the 1990s. Well, let's talk about Ukraine's leadership. And I'm very interested in, so up until 2014, um, the Maidan protests, is it fair to say that 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 leadership in Ukraine was pretty friendly towards Putin and what, you know, Putin's policies. And then can you just talk about like how things changed uh, after 2014 and how dramatic that was, that change between Putin and Ukrainian leadership? Well, uh, Ukrainian leadership um, in the 1990s and the beginning of 2000s uh, they were products of the of the um, Soviet uh, of the Soviet realities. The, the, the president of Ukraine was the former party official, like in Russia, of course, Yeltsin was. So there was a lot in common between between the the rulers in in Russia and in Ukraine in the 1990s. So there were drinking bodies, there were, of course, tensions, and there were politics involved, but they came from the same, uh, they were cut from the same clothes, and, and that's, that's also helped to keep, to keep the, the, this, this relationship in, in, in a particular, in, 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 without, without military conflict, I would say. Uh, and uh, Ukrainian leadership also, Lacked, uh, lacked really experience of being um, a leader of independent state or independent country. Uh, they were looking up to Moscow, looking for the for the models of, of political political uh, instruments and and political models as well, and uh, were trying to do the same thing as Yeltsin was doing. And what Yeltsin was doing through most of the 1990s. Is consolidating his power and building authoritarian state. After he gave an order to fire at the Russian parliament in 1993, rewrote constitution, the, the, the Russia went uh, with every single year was moving further and further down the road of, the, of authoritarianism. And the Ukrainian elites were actually trying to emulate what Russia was doing. But they encountered a very different, very different mentality of their own people. Uh, Ukrainians uh, didn't accept that. They rebelled. There was the Orange Revolution of 2004, uh, 
uh, over stolen elections, rigged elections. In Russia, never mobilization on that level happened. At that time, President of Ukraine, Kuchma, allegedly told Putin, who was pushing him toward using military force against the uh, protesters, he told him Ukraine is not Russia and published published uh, later book with that title. So the Ukrainian elites who really very much wanted to continue in the in the in, in the following following the Russian elites really encountered the the, the, the people whom who, who wouldn't accept that that, that, that that sort of policies from the government. And Ukraine for a number of historical reasons turned out to be much more uh, pluralistic and much more pro-democratic than, than Russia. And um, uh, really attempts attempts on the part of Putin to support uh, pro-Russian, which means much more authoritarian candidates, uh, failed. The um, um, Russian uh, invasion in Ukraine, the annexation of the Crimea starts after the revolution of dignity and after the candidate for the, and, and actually at that time already president of Ukraine, backed by Russia, Mr. Yanukovych was, had to, to, to flee Kyiv, left Kyiv, right? So that was, that was uh, um, the end of big hopes and one, one story of trying to install in Ukraine uh, um, pro-Russian candidate that automatically would be anti-West and, and automatically would be pro-authoritarian. Um, so um, that's 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 the, the the relationship between the Ukrainian Ukrainian people, the Ukrainian elite in the nineties and the beginning of the two thousands, and, and and Russia. So again and again, there was there was this rejection of of uh, uh, pro authoritarian tendencies coming from from the top of the government. Um, I'll just give you one, one example. Uh, the Revolution of Dignity. It started as in, in 2013 as a so-called Euro Revolution or European Revolution. Uh, Russia forced Yanukovych uh, refused to sign association agreement with the European Union that he promised to his people that he would do that. And the people came to the uh, main square in Kiev called, uh, called Maidan to protest against that. And uh, there was protests going on for some period of time, not very massive. And then, then at some point in late November of 2013, the government decided to use police to disperse students who were um, occupied Maidan, occupied the square, who were actually uh, uh, built their, their, their camp there. And uh, once the police does that, the next morning, half of a million of people show in downtown Kiev. Uh, 10, maybe 100 times more than showed people at the beginning over the issue of your integration. Because the idea was, no, 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 you're not allowed to do that in our country. You, you, can't, you, you can't beat up uh, our, our children. We are here to protect them and, and we'll stay and you, will, and you will be gone. And what became known as originally as uh, the Euro Revolution acquired a new name, Revolution of Dignity. And that change happened at the moment when the, uh, uh, a couple of dozen of students maybe a hundred, a little bit more, were beaten up by the police. The people showed up on the street and said, no, that's, that's the red line. Uh, and um, that's, that's very different, certainly, from what, what you see in Russia. In Russia, you see US police and people, people run away. It's, 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 it's different. Well, let's, let's talk about the relationship between Zelensky and Putin. What what has how would you characterize historically their relationship, and um, how how did Putin initially feel when Zelensky was elected? 
Well, we, we, we know that uh, quite well because um, in the uh, essay that I mentioned that Putin wrote before the start of the war on the uh, historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians, there is closer to the end one paragraph where he writes that um, the West introduced in Ukraine this awful system and he has in mind uh, um, democracy, that uh, people change and parties change, but, but the attitude stays the same, he calls it anti-Russian, which means really the, the commitment to independence. And uh, he says that, well, the current, the current president was elected on the promise of bringing peace, and he lied, and, and that's, that's, that, that's what democracy is about. It's, it, it's about lies. So to unpack that, uh, uh, that, 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 that paragraph in that article, what that means that Putin really had high hopes for um, unexperienced uh, um, former comedian, Mr. Zelensky, um, coming to power and accepting, accepting the sort of relations between Russia and Ukraine that Putin wanted wanted him to accept. And uh, to a degree, uh, things were, were going uh, exactly in the direction that Putin wanted because uh, Zelensky informally accepted the um, Russian interpretation of the formula of the Minsk agreements of the peace uh, or armistice agreement between Russia and Ukraine in, in 2014-2015. Uh, but um, within a few weeks, uh, Zelensky got on his hands another uh, mass revolution in the making. Uh, the mass movement that was started under the slogans, no to capitulation. And uh, Zelensky, uh, being a democratically elected leader, changed the course. They met with Putin in uh, December of 2019 in Paris, and uh, to Putin's disappointment, Zelensky said that he was not signing the sort of documents that Putin wanted him to sign. Uh, and that 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 that, 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 that certainly was uh, that certainly was a turning point. Uh, and uh, um, the um, I, I think that uh, Putin never really. Um, understood not only Ukraine, but he never understood the phenomenon of Zelensky. And uh, in my opinion, at least, Zelensky's biggest talent is, is uh, uh, certainly was there when he was an actor and comedian. And uh, he, he, brought, he continued, he brought the talent into the president's office. He has this ability, he has this uh, uh, talent to, to, to fill the audience know what the people want. And uh, um, he, is, uh, he is there really to amplify the, the, the attitudes of the people. And uh, we started the discussion, I said that he was really in the, in the, in, in, uh, the, 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 the key figure um, uh, articulating Ukrainian disbelief or refusal to believe that a big war could happen. And then within one day became also the, the leader of the, of, of, of the of resistance. And in, in both cases, he, he, represented, he represented his people. And uh, yeah, so the, there, is, there, is, the, the, there are good reasons for Mr. Putin to be very unhappy with that awful system of government called democracy. Yeah, well, you know, the world has really rallied around Zelensky, and he's, you know, the whole world knows his name. He's always on TV. Uh, he's meeting with all sorts of world leaders and, and well-known people. I wonder, do you think if somebody besides Zelensky were in power, do you think that, how how much do you think him as a person and as a leader 
has has helped Ukraine up to this point? And do you think it would be differently if even somebody else with his same political leanings were in power? Very important. Very important. The right, uh, the right person at the right time in the right place. Um, Ukraine, Ukrainian people got really very lucky having uh, Zelensky at that moment in, in, uh, in, in, in the history at the helm. Uh, that being said, um, uh, his, his, his biggest strength is still basically being able to, to channel the, 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 the feelings, the, 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 the um, determination of, of Ukrainians as a whole. At no point uh, in in the war, even in the worst weeks, the first weeks of the war, there were less than uh, seventy to eighty percent of Ukrainians who uh, believed, according to the polling data, in victory. And uh, it, it was almost surreal in early March to read that th- those numbers. Um, uh, but uh, I would say that. Probably, if we take let's say seventy-five percent, uh, at least fifteen percent of that of, of those of those seventy-five would be would be Zelensky's. But there was sixty that, that, that were not Zelensky, and Zelensky took sixty and turned it into eighty, and now into ninety. So that's 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 my my at least take on, on who Zelensky is and how important he is for, for the story. Yeah, and, you know, I think about I think about that a lot, just like his his ability to to rally people and rally the world. I mean, I'm in a very small town uh, here in the eastern seaboard in in the United States, and there are Ukraine flags all over the like the light poles, and there are Ukraine fundraisers at the community center. And I think a lot, you know, if that all would be happening, if if someone else were in power in Ukraine. Who maybe didn't have that kind of charisma? Uh, yes, yes, yes. I I, I agree, and I, I know um, through through rumor mill <laughs> that um, many many politicians uh, in U.S. but also in Europe are a little bit jealous uh, in, in <laughs> terms of the, of, of the messaging of other things. That there are all sorts of a lot of stuff. Uh, a, a lot of thought goes into how how to do this and that, and Zelensky can achieve this one tweet. Things that that uh, is difficult to achieve otherwise. He also makes some people unhappy that he talks to the people uh, sometimes above the heads of their leaders <laughs> and gets people on his side. Uh, so um, that's 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 uh, that, 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 that is quite phenomenal. Mm, uh, but again, uh, the, the, there is also a bigger bigger story behind that, and that story is that um, I don't I don't think I, I certainly don't remember either personally or through reading relevant, relevant literature that there was. Uh, ever such clarity about the war moral clarity of who is aggressor, who is victim, probably since World War II. In some, in some books, the, the World War II called uh, a good war in, in terms of if you look at it from perspective of Korea, you look at that from the perspective of Vietnam, Afghanistan, it was the war for the right cause. You knew you knew where where the good guys were, where the bad guys were. You knew what what it was happening, and then there was a lot of shades of gray with many other wars. And the Ukrainian war, uh, it's not just U.S. experience, but also but also European. Uh, the, the, there is very little gray. There is very little gray. It's it's unprovoked aggression. It's the case, first case in the 20th century since the, for the annexation of the territories by a bigger country. And uh, then there is absolutely phenomenal uh, resistance of, of a smaller nation 
a bigger one when no one was um, giving Ukraine um, uh, a chance to, to last for more than two weeks. Blitzkrieg. That's that's what Putin was planning. That's what the the uh, American intelligence services were saying. It can be a blitzkrieg of, of, within two weeks. And given that the U.S. intelligence services got right Putin's uh, Putin's intentions almost to the day of the of the attack. Uh, it was very difficult to dismiss also other part of, of, of uh, uh, prediction coming from, from the U.S. intelligence services that Ukraine would, probably would not last, and Ukraine lasts. So all of these things certainly certainly came together, and, and again, uh, Zelensky became the face of that and, and the voice of, of many of these things. Yeah, uh, you're so right in the point that you make about the 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 clear good guy and clear bad guy and kind of that, that the ability of that for people to, to rally. So before we were on, I mentioned that um, creative writing is, is my background. I'm I'm working on a novel. It's a world war II novel. And I feel like people ask me a lot, you know, what is the fascination with world war II in, in literature? You know, why are people buying so many world war II novels? Um, Why are there so many world war II uh, movies and I have always thought that it's just for like what you were you were talking about. There's a clear good guy and a clear bad guy for World War II, and that that audience is much larger than say a Vietnam audience, where really there's not you know that there's a lot of gray area there, and or the Iraq War or other wars that are just so so murky. And and you're you're so right with with your assessment of this is kind of the first time since World War II that basically the entire world has been like, this is what's going on is, is wrong. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious your thoughts, switching gears a little bit here to the military situation for, for the Russo-Ukrainian war. Um, so right now we're here in 2023, summer 2023. How would you describe the current state of the war right now? Well, I think we are at the moment uh, of uh, one probably of the most decisive moments in the war. I would say that there were um, two two moments like that before that. The first one was um, uh, the really Russian defeat in, in the battle for, for Kiev and withdrawal. So that was really very important. That was a clear signal that whatever happens in the war, uh, most likely Ukraine will stay. Ukraine will survive. The goal was attack on the capital, decapitation, including, including Ukraine in the, in the Russian sphere of influence, the so-called denazification and really rounding up uh, the leaders of the public opinion, journalists, um, uh, politicians uh, who uh, take strong pro-independence position and in one way or another get rid of them. Uh, and uh, after, after that, by March, late March of, um, and early April of um, 2022, it became clear that, okay, Ukraine is there to stay. Kiev is there to stay. Uh, but it was not clear uh, what what the territory would be under Kiev control after that. And um, uh, the next turning point was in the summer of 2022. By that time, Russians achieved their biggest successes uh, in the south and in the east of the country captured uh, uh, after long battle two important cities in Donbass. Uh, but that turned out to be last, last uh, Russian success. And uh, in the fall, two successful Ukrainian counteroffensives, one in the east near Kharkiv, and then another pushing the Russians from the south on the right bank of Dnipro, uh, 
uh, certainly uh, turned turned the tide, and now Ukrainians were on the on the offensive. Mm, that that was the situation by the end of 2022. 2023 started with two big questions. First of all, there was realization that the the most important developments of the war will be happening on the battlefield, not at the negotiation table. And on the battlefield, there were two things in preparation. First, the Russian military uh, winter offensive, and uh, then uh, Ukrainian counteroffensive. That that's, was already in early, 19, in, in early 2023. That's what was discussed. So by now we have answer to the first of those questions of what came out of the Russian winter offensive. Uh, it completely failed. There was minimal territorial uh, acquisitions and uh, major, major losses for the Russian army. Uh, those losses in particular of the Wagner group became the basis and foundation for the mutiny uh, or uh, attempted coup d'etat in uh, Russia that we saw the previous week. This, these are the units that suffered the most. The estimates are that they lost up to 20,000 people in the Wagner groups alone. And uh, that's, that's, that's uh, really the, 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 the result, the outcome of this really failed failed winter offensive. So Ukrainians went on counter-offensive now, and uh, um, there were expectations that they would be more successful and that counter-offensive would actually proceed faster than, than it, is, it is happening now. Uh, what we see is that uh, Ukrainians uh, continue to attack, uh, they make uh, uh, progress in terms of recapturing territory, nothing compared to the counteroffensives of the, of the 2022, but still they captured more territory than Russians captured during the, the offensive. And uh, Ukrainian counteroffensive is not over yet. Uh, the latest what we heard from um, the commander of uh, Ukrainian armed forces, General Zaluzhny, was that he needs uh, he needs and, and hopes for uh, uh, more uh, more shells, more ammunition, and uh, he needs F sixteens. Every uh, the the. Counteroffensives that were conducted back in 2022, when there was just one line of defense, and Ukrainians would actually cut through it. That was around Kharkiv, or try to squeeze out the Russian troops by cutting the supply lines, the bridges across the Dnieper. That tactic can't work today. Russians used the last half of a year to build multi-layer defenses. So to go to get through that defense, you, the, the defenses you need really um, uh, air superiority, uh, and uh, Ukraine has today uh, air inferiority. I, I, I sh you, you please correct me, and, and your viewers and listeners again probably can disagree. But for me, I'm not a military historian. I uh, looking at the way how United States. Uh, um, conducts its operations. It is all about air superiority. It's all about air superiority. Um, uh, Ukrainians managed so far to fight without that that factor. So, judging by what what we hear from Ukraine, they reach the point where they um, probably still can fight in that way. But it it it, it would be extreme, uh, very costly. Uh, and long-range long missiles and long-range artillery, which is not given to Ukraine for political reasons. The concern is, of course, uh, the, 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 the reaction from Russia. 
So um, Ukrainians, if, if you look in, in, in terms of the how the war is being fought, they're fighting with one hand. <laughs> the, 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 the other hand is tied up. Um, again, Ukraine and government and, and Zelensky and people are very, very, of course, appreciative of all the assistance that comes to, comes to Ukraine. Without that assistance, it would be difficult, if not impossible, to continue the fight. Uh, but it's also very clear that that the, the two sides fighting this war are not are not uh, are not are, are not uh, equal in terms of their of their uh, armaments, equipments, capacities. Uh, uh, Ukraine still continues to be an underdog in that fight. Uh, I'm curious how how much of a mistake, if you think it is a mistake, how much of a mistake do you think it is that the, the Ukrainians aren't being supplied with fighter jets and, and long range weapons? Uh, well, it's uh, I, I uh, certainly think it is a mistake. Uh, but I also look at this as a basically uh, almost a systematic mistake because it's uh, we have the repetition of the same of the same story. Um, on the one hand, United States is the biggest supplier, certainly a military supplier for Ukraine. Uh, on the other hand, it takes enormous amount of time for the U.S. government to decide. Uh, to to do that or not to do the the, the original decision was that um, let's let's provide stingers and and uh, javelins eventually so defense weapons that the uh, partisan units could could use so there was mistrust that Ukrainian armed forces could continue for more than a couple of days. And uh, then there were concerns about uh, what, what what the Russian reaction would be. So it's mm, uh, there is a game in Washington uh, of, that people continue playing uh, a game of imagination to a degree. They imagine where Putin's red lines could be. They don't want them to cross. They don't want to cross right away. And uh, this is this is a long, long process of uh, really arriving to the to the idea that okay, there should be humorous. Okay, then the next step. Well, maybe tanks is not such a bad idea if you think about counteroffensive. <laughs> and it takes takes a long time to convince to convince uh, parts of Washington that somehow tanks are needed for. For counteroffensive, and now it looks like there is there is the next stage. There are people who believe that well, Ukrainians can be very successful in counteroffensive without uh, without jets, and uh, then feel disappointed when they don't see the results coming within the next two weeks. And so we are we are basically in, in the place where. Where we were with uh, Himars, where we were with the tanks, where we were with some other uh, some other uh, armaments. I think that jets eventually are coming, but uh, it's it, it it takes time, and in Ukrainian case, it's it's about it's about lives, and uh, the, the the more weapons, the the, the 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 sooner the sooner the war would end. There is no question about that. And Ukrainians, Ukrainians showed their ability to fight. It's, uh, uh, we, we talked about Zelensky. He is compared sometimes to Winston Churchill. And one of the journalists called him Winston Churchill with iPhone. And um, Churchill addressing, it seems to me, U.S. Congress at some point said early in the war when U.S. Were not were not involved, but they, it seems to me at that time Len Blees was not there yet. His call was that give us the tools and we will finish the job. 
So it, it looks like the, the, the Americans are in the same situation. It's not. It's not Vietnam. It's not. It's not Korea. It's not Afghanistan. Mm, Ukrainians are not asking for American boots on the ground here or there. It's basically um, it's Churchillian request. Give us the tools and we'll finish the job. Uh, I'm curious. You mentioned the uh, recent attempted coup d'état from. The, uh, the leader Prigozhin from the Wagner Group. I'm curious your thoughts as a historian. How important uh, was how important of a moment was that attempted coup in Russia? And you know, what do you think that means for for the future of how Russia is is able to fight this war? Well, uh, the um, bad news from the front lines uh, historically. Um, serve as triggers in Russia for um, uh, either political crisis or major political change. Um, Last Crimean War in mid-19th century produces major, major transformation and reforms in Russia. Uh, Bad news from um, uh, the Far East during the Russo-Japanese War in 1905 become trigger for the revolution of 1905. The um, Russian losses in World War I serve as a trigger to the revolution, two revolutions of 1917. Um, the um, war in, in uh, Afghanistan and Russian, uh, Soviet at that time, in, involvement there is certainly a precursor to the reforms of uh, Mikhail Gorbachev and eventually disintegration of the Soviet Union. And uh, now we see a failed winter offensive and revolt of the units that actually was really decimated uh, by the by by the fighting. Uh, This really, really is taking over a number of major Russian towns uh, with the possibility of split in the military command, the, the information that we get now that a number of generals are either arrested or interrogated, so they're, they're certainly not in, in the public. And uh, that, that's uh, certainly uh, an indication, first of all, of the weakness of the regime. To a degree, that regime was actually, uh, was incapable even crushing this this revolt. They made some sort of a strange deal where on the one one day Prigozhin is called by Putin himself to be a traitor and another another day the criminal investigation against him is closed. That's, that's not whatever happens with Prigozhin in the future. The, the, this is not a really sign of the strength of the regime. And uh, that also um, uh, suggests that uh, things like that can, can can continue if if the war doesn't go the way how Putin really wants it to go. So from that point of view, if if we have a successful Ukrainian counteroffensive to a degree that the defenses were successful early in the year. That can very well produce another political crisis and can end war sooner than than we, we can imagine now. Um, but uh, if if uh, uh, there is so, sort of a stalemate, that it will continue. It can lead certainly to the to the um, um, sort of um, solidifying of the uh, of. Putin's power on Russia, uh, and uh, maybe rebuilding, re- recapturing some of the political territory that he certainly lost with this, with this coup. So it's 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 essential what happens in the coming weeks and months, and uh, what happens very much depends on the supplies of the of the um, ammunition and 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 weaponry to Ukraine. Serhi, this has been such a, a fantastic interview, and I've loved the answers that you give me to, to my questions. Um, my, my last question for you here is um, uh, maybe predicting the future a little bit. 
historians, I feel like, are often the best predictors of the future. But you know, it's this is this is such a strange moment in time. Maybe it's just hard to to do this exercise. But I'm curious, one, what you think the outcome of the war will be, and you know, if Russia wins, what will the world look like? And then if Ukraine wins, what will the world look like? Well, if Russia wins, uh, what we see is um, uh, the victory for the um, mm-hmm. principle of aggression. Uh, you can you can go militarily and take over this territory, that territory, annex it. Uh, the the international law really will mean even less than it means now, than it means today. Um, and that's, that's a major, major um, uh, really blow to the international order as a whole. Um, Russia's victory also means victory of autocratic regimes. Uh, and uh, we are in a very precarious situation both in the United States and worldwide, because the recession of 2008 produced politically the same outcomes as the Great Depression of 1929-1932 produced. A lot of uh, xenophobia, populism, nationalism eventually resulted in, in the big war. We have uh, the, the, the rise of the, of the populist and nationalist leaders globally, worldwide. So it's a global battle. If, if one of their guys wins, they all win. Uh, so it's, 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 it's a battle for democracy. And uh, uh, it's, it's not just a cliche. I'm not just saying something to, 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 to sound somehow global or alarmist or mobilize support for Ukraine where, where maybe there is no reason for that. Uh, it, it, is, it, it is a case of um, clash between uh, autocracy and, and democracy. And it's important who wins in that, in, in that scale. Now, if Ukraine wins, that means a major, uh, major um, uh, factor toward the restoration of the international order and uh, some some semblance of international law. Uh, that means also the the, the the stop of the of the um, this uh, anti-democratic and authoritarian wave that has been in the world since since 2008 and certainly certainly. Um, Putin was was one of, of, of the leaders, and uh, in, in still being global in my in my assessment, but maybe less global than talking about this uh, world world fight between autocracy and democracy. We can also uh, project that uh, China's uh, readiness to um, try luck with uh, military um, intervention or military occupation of Taiwan probably would be much less there if if Ukraine wins, and it would be would be much more likely if Russia wins. Uh, so there is a lot a lot of, um, uh, at stake uh, beyond beyond just Ukraine independence of Ukraine or the the future of the post-Soviet space. It's, 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 really, it's really a global, global uh, struggle. Um, uh, it's, it's just putting things in the perspective. This is the largest war. It was till recently in Europe, but now I believe it's the largest war in the world since World War II in terms of the number of troops on the ground, the casualties, the sort of destruction, the weaponry that is being used, the resources that are being spent, the, the, the refugees. Uh, I, I, I think that there is, it's, it's, it's a really global, it's a really global struggle also from that point of view. Excellent. Well, thank you so much again for your answers to my questions and for your time. Serhi, if if people want to follow you or 
you know, stay in touch with your work? Are you on social media? How can, how can people stay in touch with what you're doing? Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you for this uh, conversation. I really, really enjoyed the questions, really enjoyed um, uh, our, our, our discussion. Uh, yes, I, I am present on, on social media, uh, on the Facebook. I'm not a very good friend, but I'm, I, I'm present. And maybe I'm a little bit better friend on, on, on Twitter. So I'm, I'm, certainly, I'm certainly present there. And um, I keep, keep people updated on uh, not just on my work, but also on, on things about this war that I consider to be important. I uh, try not to, to uh, make commentary too often. I do that from time to time, but I do that when I think, okay, this is something important and something where I have an insight and I want to share that insight. Wonderful. Um, well, uh, Serhii Plochi, the Russo-Ukrainian War, the return of history, uh, go buy a copy, go check it out from your library. Um, what a, a timely book um, that, uh, that I hope a lot of people read. And again, Serhii, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Agent.